what we're losing fast is our memory of the early days of American television, oh. which were all live. Yes. Not live on tape, but yes. actually live. Yes. And you started in live. And how, how did you start? You were, you were an actor. Yeah, I was an actor. And uh, as a matter of fact, I had done six, year, uh, six summer stock years and two winter stock. And I got started writing for television, live television in those days, because my wife was on. She was an ingenue doing all kinds of shows. And she asked me, uh, you know, why don't you <laughs> write one? She was, I always thought she was wonderful. I always told her she was wonderful, but the shows weren't so good, you know? So she said, why don't you try it yourself? So I did. I wrote, um, I sh wrote a show for ourselves, a situation comedy for ourselves. And we, we sold it to WOR. When WR opened, when they first <laughs> opened in New York, yeah. Channel 9 in New York, we were the second show on the air. And we went on with that uh, situation comedy. It was called Apartment 3C. It was just the two of us. And we did that for about three months. And then the powers that be thought it might be a good idea if we went into mystery. And so then we called ourselves Mr. and Mrs. Mystery. And we were on then for about another year and a half, uh -huh. writing them <laughs> every week. The, the comedy show was, a, uh, it was stripped. 15 minutes every night writing them and doing them. And then when I got to the half hour once a week, it was like such a relief <laughs> to write a half hour mystery once a week. And I did that for about a year and then we were able to afford some other writers to come in. We couldn't afford too many actors. We had about five actors, so it wasn't too difficult to guess who the villain was because you only had about four or five <laughs> to choose from. And, uh, and we always learned everybody's lines. We had to because in those days, actors just weren't used to live TV and it didn't, <laughs> like the theater where you can hear it in the wings or whatever, you had to come through. So really to protect ourselves, we found out that we just, I knew, I wrote most of the shows, and so I knew them all, and Bobby, my wife, would memorize lines, and we just filled in anytime anybody went up. We, we, we were right there filling them in. It was quite an extraordinary time. It was a wonderful, exciting time. And what was great about it, because it, what made it such a wonderful opportunity, is because, well, you know the golden line, nobody knows anything. At that time, nobody knew anything, but they admitted they didn't know anything <laughs> because nobody knew anything about television and what it was and how it works and what was going to make it succeed. Yeah, it was terrific. And then I had to make that decision, whether I'm going to go on <laughs> acting or whether I'm going to become a writer. So I said, I'll write a show without us, <laughs> without Mr. and Mrs. I'll write a show that I think would make a good half-hour drama. There were so many of anthology shows then, you know. And so I wrote one, and my agent, Blanche Gaines, who handled all kinds of writers in those days, Rod and Frank Gilbert, and I wrote a show, and she called me up about four days later, said, Lux Video Theater is going to do it. So I said to my wife, geez, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I ought to get with this writing. She called me up two days later and said, John, <laughs> Frederick March and his wife are going to play the leads. So I said to Bobby, I'm going to write for a while. I'm really going to try this writing. I did one more season of Summerstock after that, but then uh, I've really been writing. Well, they, yeah. they of course, were great, great theater and motion picture stars. Oh, yeah. yeah. They were, oh, God, yeah. They were, it, it, it was so exciting, you know, because another thing, in those half-hour shows, especially the hour shows, so different, they were like a play. You rehearse. You could, the director wanted you there. You were at the table for the read-throughs. You were there for the rehearsals, whichever ones you wanted to attend, and you attended them. And you all felt, you know, like this was the, we're, we're going on into a theater here. It was terrific, and there's some wonderful, wonderful directors there. Some of them gone on, some of them disappeared. You know, it was truly collaborative. Oh I mean, yes, you, you Espe a lot of according to the director. Um, Sidney Lumet, which I did, yeah. it was just wonderful, and, and just dragged you in. <laughs> you know, look what we've done today. He wanted you to see everything. Look. Sure. But even then, that was exciting. And, uh, and working with the actors in rehearsal uh, without any problems whatsoever was, yeah. was, was exciting. I can remember, in particular, I did a Civil War play with um, Lee Marvin. And they brought him out from Hollywood, so all the New York actors were kind of looking at him askance. And he was terrible. He was just terrible. And the director got this idea. It was Civil War fight. Let's put put him in. <laughs> let's put him in the uniform. Let's put him in the Union uniform and give him a fake musket and have him rehearse with it. It just turned out to be better than anybody else. He was just sure. once he got that in, that was his persona. Then he, then he had it. You know. Yeah. No, it, they, they, it was a, an exciting time, and uh, you just it, it, those days. <laughs> they call them the golden years. You know. And, did you know uh, Patty Chayefsky? No, I did never, yeah. never knew. He was one of. The, he never. If he had been one of Blanche Gaines, 
uh, clients, you know, I would have known him. But I knew Abby, you know, Mann, and of course Frank Gehry and Rod Serling, of course. Sure. Rod and I um, came out just about the same time, yeah. came out here. Yeah. It was a very difficult, uh, very difficult situation for us to break with Blanche because after we were out here about two years, it just no, there was no reason for her to be our agent anymore. Yeah. Everything was being done out here. And he wrote a play about it. He felt quite guilty about it. Wrote a play called *The Velvet Alley*. *The Velvet Alley*. Yeah, yeah. yeah. with J Jack Klugman played Blanche. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the 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 thing that happened in that story on Playhouse 90 was that <coughs> the agent was killed and yeah. had a heart attack. Yeah. And that uh, Blanche Blanche Gaines uh, was very upset about that. She called me. Yeah. During the show. Yes. Blanche Gaines called me during the show and said, "I don't want to spoil it for you. Spoil it for you, but." I die at the end, <laughs> and uh, but she was right. They got along. You know, Blanche and Rod were. She, she was closer than, he was closer to her than any of us. But although we were all, he was our mother <laughs> superior. I tell you, you know. In those days, when you when you in the days of the dramatic stories, yeah. half hour, one hour, mm -hmm. whatever, um, when you went, you generally did you write speculatively oh yes always yeah. always, always so you originals, wrote always the play spec. and then attempted to sell it oh yes always spec always originals and as a matter i remember uh, i got some very good advice from charles jackson once the fellow that wrote the lost weekend yeah. and I, I was i had sold a couple of half hour ones but i i wasn't getting i was missing out on two or three he says john let me give you a secret if you want to sell this market <laughs> i'm ready for it uh, <laughs> he said what he says when you write the half hour show, anthology show, pretend you're just writing the third act. Pretend you're right in the beginning of the third act and take it from there. Son of a God, I, I, it worked for me. It worked for me. I started out with a boom bang, you know, and so forth, and then just kind of filled it in as it, as it went through to try and bring you up. But it was, it was wonderful advice. He was a, he was a one, terrific man, wonderful guy. I wrote mostly just things I wanted to do and yeah. things I felt, and I was very I, I wrote three Civil War dramas. I, I really was attached to it. And it was a Civil War drama, really, that brought me out here. I had written a, uh, uh, a play about Civil War and which, in which Heck Hill Lancaster, a company out here, yeah. they, <laughs> by sheer luck, they all saw the thing and brought me out. What program was that on? It was on, I think it was Kraft. probably Kraft. Kraft. So I think, yeah, probably be Kraft or Alcoa Goodyear. I'm not sure. Probably Kraft, though. Kraft had a... Uh, Kraft had a policy one year in live television of having their viewers write in and say which was the best play of the year. Because they did 50 of them, <laughs> after the 52, I think. And the winner gets $50,000. Now, mind you, they weren't paying us but $800 for the damn show, or yeah. 900 and they're going to give the winner of the year 50 and I came in second. Nothing. Oh, <laughs> Nothing. Geez. I'll oh. never remember. A, a play called Snap Finger Creek won, and I could have killed I said, why couldn't those people, why couldn't they have just divided it up at least with five or six guys who are not paying us anything anyway, you know? You know, another thing peculiar about live television, and when you think about it today, but you take Lux Video Theater, say had the star, say they even had Florence Eldridge, as, as they did in mine. But any, any woman star of the Lux Video Theater, always, I don't know if you remember this, but at the end of the program, when the show was over, a f camera would come in, a fake camera would come into a fake dressing room where she sits at the, at the dressing table and says, I don't know about you, but I always use Lux. <laughs> Can you imagine these actresses <laughs> doing something like that today? Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, it's hard. Oh. There are so many stories about about foul ups in live television because you couldn't take it over. There was no tape. Yeah. And d did anything happen in one of your scripts that was? Oh, uh, one uh, one fake thing happened. <laughs> uh, uh, they didn't make kinescopes. They had no kinescopes of our show. What they did one time, they wanted to prove. This is before three camera comedies. Yeah. They wanted to prove that motion picture cameras could come in and do it in two or three cameras and do a show within the, just in the, in the time of the show. What they did, they filmed us before. <laughs> Got us all set. And then they, and then they did this show for these, th these possible sponsors to come in, you know, and, and do it in that format. And of course it was all fake and so forth. I've never, I never found out whatever happened to that film of us, but it's the only thing that ever existed of us. So it's all gone. <laughs> kinescope, you know, with the old joke, you probably heard this now. The old joke in Kinescope is that, uh, uh, kin, meaning 
a relative, your brother or your uncle, and scope meaning to see, to something with vision, and kinescope meaning you can't recognize your own uncle. <laughs> and you couldn't. <laughs> and everybody out here in California, that's all you got was that's kinescope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We saw the very well-known shows in a kinescope, a delayed broadcast, which I think was taken off the tube directly. And we saw them that way, and they were murky and muddy. Oh, yes. Out here, it must have been. But I lived in New York those <laughs> days, watching it. Came, of course, Playhouse 90 was done out here, but that that's time, right. was, that's a different time. That's, a, that's an interesting time of Playhouse 90 because that was the beginning of tape, yeah. for me anyway. In other words, they did live television, but they would take five minutes of tape and then ten minutes of tape. Mm -hmm. If, if I uh, did one, one of the Playhouse 90s was a uh, uh, World War I piece, and I opened it with a battlefield. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to do that part on tape. Yeah. for the first five minutes of the show, and then the rest of it was studio. Yeah. But then they kept creeping up, doing more and more, and pretty soon tape just took over the thing. And, yeah. and so live went out. When you were, when you were doing that, and, and they always used to say that live television was a com peculiar combination of the theater and cinema, and made it, it made itself, it, it became its own medium. Yeah, that's, yes, yes. I think live... Yes, uh, live, t uh, live television, yeah. yes. And uh, certainly, as I said, it was rehearsed as theater. It was rehearsed as theater. You yeah. didn't have as many, you, you weren't rehearsing for four weeks, but you were rehearsing for almost two weeks. And the problem then, I always felt, was that you'd go into the studio and you'd have a uh, rehearsal, a tech run through, then you'd have a dress run through, and then you'd do the show. And it was all done too quickly. Once you got into the set, it was all done too quickly. Even in spite of the rehearsals, I felt, always felt there should have been two days on the set and rehearsing, but they couldn't have, it was too expensive to yeah. do that. The, a lot of the people, a lot of the writers who went into the early days of live television were young people who had tried to write plays for Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, one or two of them had had a play on Broadway, yeah. but most of them had theater training. Was yeah. that a benefit? Well, uh, theater training was not as, not for writing plays because I had only written one play, but it certainly was a benefit as an actor. I got to yeah. tell you, uh, in, the, in the summer stock, I mean, we did 11 plays a season, yeah. and you're doing everything from you know, butlers to leading men and, uh, and character parts. One summer I had clown white in my hair all summer long doing character parts. In fact, my wife was my fiancé then. They thought she was going out with an old man. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> but what happens is, I think, doing all those plays in Winterstock and in Summerstock, not only the dialogue and, and hearing, <laughs> the, how, you, you can hear how things work in yeah. your head. And so you write dialogue, you write it really almost as, as, as that part, but as an actor, you know whether that line can be said. You feel if that line can be said or not be said. And a lot of novels you read yeah. that are very good novels, the dialogue is not all that great. They, I don't know what they just, and then, and then structure too. Structure has a big, you know, when you're in that many plays, you feel the beginning, it's osmosis, it sure. sinks in. And, had, and I had no idea I was going into writing then, but my God, it was invaluable. Invaluable yeah. as a writer, I think. So you, s you begin to sense structure as oh, you work. Oh, yes, as you work, not yeah. from the sense of, oh, I'm going to write and I want to write a play, but just from the, just, <laughs> just from the, there it is, and yeah. you're going through it. You know? In that kind of an environment, when there were so many shows that mm. would accept scripts to do, mm -hmm. um, how did you get your ideas? <laughs> I just, I don't, I, I cannot answer you that yeah. question. Like the first one I wrote uh, without us, you know, I just, ha I just had, I, I don't know where I got them. I just yeah. <laughs> Personal experience, family? Uh, everything, well, yeah. of course, some of yeah. that, you know, all of, some of the, everything comes from you in yeah. a way. You know, from that standpoint, sure. but in, but everything was everything was spec and everything was original at that time. Yeah. I, I don't I, I was never ever assigned anything at that time. I used my old Royal Portable that I had in high school, and I used that right up until right up until sometimes a great notion. I was still using that, that little Royal typewriter. You know, yeah. in fact, I wrote them a thank you note. Royal, telling them that I was this because it was beginning to break down on me. I thought they might give me a new one. Instead, they, <laughs> they said, well, it's time you changed your typewriter. <laughs> I went through the stages first into uh, uh, to an electric uh, typewriter, an electronic typewriter, and then finally to the word processor. And oh, <laughs> God, those first. I swear, you boot that thing up in the morning, and it says on the screen, I hate you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd say, I hate you back. <laughs> but, you know, but then it becomes, of course, it becomes invaluable, for, for, not for writing, but yeah. for rewriting. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you wrote the play, 
that brought you out to California. But you mean the Civil War play? The Civil War yeah. play. That was a Civil War setting, and the Hecht Hill Lancaster people mm -hmm. saw it. Yes. And you came out, and you you worked for Burt Lancaster yes. and company for a long time. Yes, Could you three tell years us about almost. Uh, well, <clears throat> I had no idea about Hollywood then, even though I originally am from California, but I never, you know, I never worked here. And Hecht Hill Lancaster that time, they were a very strong independent company in, yeah. in this town. They were the independent company and they had, they were kind of wild and crazy, <laughs> I gotta tell you. They worked weekends, they worked, uh, I worked Saturdays, many Sundays, you know, I, and, I, and, and uh, Harold had a yacht that we went out in all the time and I thought, God, this is, I guess this is it, this is Hollywood, you go out. I can remember Bobby Wise and getting into an airport over in Santa Monica, flying in a flying boat out to the yacht in Catalina. I thought, wow, <laughs> this is Hollywood. But then we also had meetings in the morning, like 5.30 in the morning. And there would be Jim Hill and, and, and uh, Harold. And then I found out afterwards they had them at 5.30 because they didn't want Bert in on that meeting. <laughs> Things like that went on. It was, uh, it was, uh, Bert was, <laughs> Bert was Bert. Yeah. He was kind of a wild man, but he was, he was um, dynamic, yeah. <laughs> to say the least. Bert was so dynamic that you go in with a story session with him in his office there. And you're writing the script, and he's looked at some pages, and, and you're going back and forth. And he says, and then he starts in. You know, his hands are going, and, thing, and he says, now, why don't you do this? And, do, and if you do this, and do that, and then you could, and I'm sitting there, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and so, and okay, and yes, yeah. So then I go upstairs to my office, and I'm sitting down, and I'm thinking, God, that doesn't <laughs> work. That doesn't work. And this, yeah. He taught his, his enthusiasm, just talked me into something that really doesn't work. So I say, now I'm going to have to go down there and tell him, Bert, that didn't work, which I did. And he always said, oh, forget it. We said, we'll do, why don't we do this <laughs> instead? <laughs> he was just, he was that way. It was, yeah. He was very nice. For me, he was very nice to work for. Yeah. And I, I was there, uh, as I say, uh, almost three years. I was kind of like the carpenter. Things I got credit for, things I didn't get credit for, you know? Well, one of the, one of the best films... I think that certainly the best job that you did and made one of the best pictures was Separate Tables, yeah. based on the Terrence Radigan play. Terrence Radigan, yes. And uh, mm -hmm. apparently, uh, that on Broadway, it was... Uh, it was uh, two separate one-act plays. Yeah, so what we had to do, we had to put them all together, you know. And uh, it, was, it was difficult from that reason, but it was difficult for other reasons, too, because it was supposed to be uh, Olivier and, and Vivian Lee, and they were supposed to play both parts, as they did on Broadway when it was two separate yeah. one-act plays. When we put them all together, they wanted to do it by, by uh, photography, trick photography, whether they could be on the screen at the same time. But then Lancaster wanted to play one of the parts, so that um, Lee, <laughs> Olivier went back to <laughs> Blighty, and then they got David Niven in, and uh, and and others, yeah. you know, and David Niven knowing that Olivier was going to play the part, he went in with great insecurity, great insecurity. What am I doing here? Of course, he got a Academy Award for it. But yeah, there was some, uh, uh, in, in constructing it, it, uh, it Radigan's such a marvelous playwright, <laughs> I gotta tell you. Uh, it was there, the characters were there, you know, and I, I consider myself lucky to get that, uh, get that credit because uh, God, Radigan's work is just superb. What you had to do was to take the separate stories to take the t and have them run concurrently. Right. Have right. them run concurrently. So what happened in the second act now happens maybe in a, a little bit of the, just beyond, a little bit into the third, first act or whatever. The two one-act plays had to be brought in and, uh, and, and then wind up with the same uh, denouement, you yeah. know. I can tell you yeah. a story about the Four Horsemen <laughs> if you want. Please. Because that was a Robert Ardrey, uh, God bless him, I don't know our Robert Audrey, but he had written the script, which was a new, new version of the, the Four Horsemen. And I was working over, I just, just started, I, I know, I'd worked on The Howl of West is One, the Jim Webb, you know, had written. Lost that arbitration. But anyway, uh, and, and they gave me, they said, they're starting a shoot in Paris. They said, uh, Minnelli's over there right now, and they're ready to go, and they have one little love scene that is not working. It's simply not working. So get on the plane tomorrow, and and read the script, you know, and get over there. And so I did. I got on the plane. Terrific. Oh, God. Paris, you know, a couple of weeks. I got on the plane. I read the script. It is, 
I shouldn't have mentioned it. It just wasn't. A, it was a script. I, I really literally did not know what to do with it. And I'm trying to think. There's five love scenes. Which one? Are all, I mean, which one? So when I get there, I'm trying to be very, very diplomatic. And Julie Blaustein was producing it. And Manelli, and we're in their, they're in their suite, and they said, what do you think of the script, John? And I said, well, I think it's got you know, a problem here or there, but never mind that. Which, which, which one of the love scenes did, did you want rewritten? No, no, no. What did you think of the script, John? Well, I, you know, I do think it had a, something here, something there. What? What? And, and Blaustein said, well, let's get on to the love story. No, no. Manelli says, no, 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 no. Why they tell me? It stinks, doesn't it? It stinks. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, no, I wouldn't say that. But yeah, there are a lot of problems. And there were, I, there were such problems, I just wanted to get off of it. I just wanted to get out of there. And um, <laughs> Manelli was not about to let me go. And I, came, I you know, I, so it was not a happy, it was one of those that was not a happy experience outside of being in Paris. Ben Matto was there at the same time we all well, dining every night. <laughs> now, was the, was the picture in pre-production at that time? or had No, they it was, they've done all their pictures. They were ready to shoot in about two or three weeks, and I'm in there trying to rewrite the whole damn thing. I said, I said to Melly, they just, I don't know how you can do this. We said, well, we got to do it, we got to do it. We can't shoot what's there, so. You had your, your hmm. had your early training to fall back on, though. Oh, boy, <laughs> yeah, I tell you, because when, the very first thing I ever did, I said, was a strip show 15 minutes every night, acting in it too, and boy, yeah. they, you had to come up with it every time, and then the half hour, yeah, all of that stuff was certainly good training, yeah, it's, it helped. I don't think it helped the picture that much, the picture wasn't that great. It's a miracle we got anything out of it. What were the other pictures that you wrote for Lancaster? Well, it Run Silent, Run Deep was the very first yeah. one. Yeah, now that was, uh, that was a marvelous submarine picture with Gable and Lancaster, that's wasn't right, it? That's right, yeah. yeah. It was not all that difficult an adaptation, but they wanted it in a hurry, and that, that's why I was working weekends. And then I can remember very well on one Saturday night, Bert said, I'm not gonna do the film. I thought, I, I went home alarmed. I said to my wife, my God, I'm, I'm two-thirds of the way through the script, three-quarters of the way through the script. Everybody seems to like it, and he's not gonna do the film, and it's his company. Oh, my God. So the next morning was a Sunday morning. I called up Harold Heck, and I said, I don't think your star is gonna do this film. He said, what, what? And I said, well, that's what he told me last night at the party. So Harold says, just stay there. I was working. He says, stay there, keep writing, and I'll get back to you. <clears throat> and sure enough, in the, so I did. I worked all day Sunday there in the, the afternoon around 2 o'clock. Um, Harold came in and says, it's all right. I spoke to, I spoke to Bert. He said, uh, uh, maybe he was feeling a little high last night or something or other, and it's going to be all right. Now, just keep working, <laughs> keep working. Yeah, you know? yeah. Gable was a nice, a really a nice man, uh, but he got it into his head that that Lancaster was out to uh, get the best part of the picture. It was it was his company, and he, and so Gable, after about three weeks of shooting, and uh, God knows how much a day, Gable decided that the script, which he had already written, I uh, read, read, the scripts. So he botches a battle over in Japan, and this crew mutinies and takes over the submarine. Gable said, no. After three weeks, no, 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 no. He says, I flew B-52s or something. Nobody mutinies in wartime. Nobody's going to do that, and he's not going to take over my boat. So, so we held up. The, we stopped shooting. They stopped shooting at God knows how long. And Jim Hill and I think, what the hell are we going to do? What we? And Bert said, it's not true. I'm not trying. We said, we know. And we read the script. He's being unreasonable. And usually, he's a very nice man, but he just got it in his head. So this is what a writer has to do sometimes. So I'm thinking to myself, what will appease him? What will make us go ahead? And I thought, what if, instead of the crew mutinying in the botched battle, <laughs> He is wounded in some way. He is hurt in some way. So that the crew has to come in and, t and Bert has to take over the boat because he can't go on. So we brought this up to uh, Gable and his agent at the time over at MCA. And Park, Arthur Park, I think his name is. And, and then we presented it to him. And Gable said, now, <laughs> now look here, John. He says, you mean that, like maybe in that scene when I'm, I'm down in the compartment with Bert, and it could be a head wound, a head wound. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. And he says, I'm talking to him there, and we're talking about the battle and everything. And I'm, and I'm going, I said, yeah, over you go. <laughs> he said, and then I'm out. Then I'm on the bunk, but you can cut to me in the bunk. I said, oh, sure. And that's what we did. That's what's in the picture. Very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Bert was a very volatile, explosive. Very volatile yeah. man, yes. Yeah. Very volatile and uh, 
fascinating man, very, very interesting man. They were all three were very strong individual personalities, Jim Hill too. And, and <clears throat> another one is, their Ber uh, is Bernie Smith, their, um, yeah. their story man. We should say that at that particular time in Hollywood history, there were very few independents. That's it right. It was all major studio work except for a few. That's right. And you have to credit Harold Heck for bringing in people like Shaevsky and Dewey Marty. And, yeah. and, uh, and then, of course, they did the other type of film, too. They did Trapeze, you yes. know, which was a tremendous, that was their biggest financial success. Yeah. But they did all kinds of work. But s eventually, they just had a falling out among each other. I think Harold and Bert had a falling out. Yeah. And, uh, and so they decided to. Yeah separate. Yeah. Uh, one of the other feature films that you made, I think this was some time later, was Sometimes a, Sometimes a Great, Great Notion, Notion. Yeah. based on a Ken Kesey <coughs> book. That's right. That, that, was a, that was a powerful story. A wonderful story, enormously difficult. As so it was <laughs> it's over 700 pages. And it was a very difficult book to do any kind of justice to it. So and when you take a situation like that, you just have to take out your primary stories. You just have to take out what is this book, what is this trying to say about this family? And it was about a family, a very independent family, the Stamper family. And in a way, for somebody like me, and, and, and Paul Newman too, it, in a way, it was an anti-union <laughs> film. <laughs> Which is, but if you you can, uh, I never really looked upon it as an anti-union film. But a lot of people told me afterwards it was. But I looked upon it as a, as a, 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 a family with relationship problems: a father and son, yes. and uh, and a daughter-in-law, and all of that. And it, it, from that stand, but. When you go back to the book, though, it's so much deeper and richer than I think anybody could have done in a two-hour film. Yeah. There's just no way you could bring it all out. There is an extraordinary scene that most people me remember yeah. with Paul Newman trying to save yes. the young man from drowning. Yes. Well, several people read for that part, and he came in and read, and I'll have the name of it. And, uh, and he a terrible reading. What in the world is that? And he gave a terrible reading. But then when he got into the part and was doing and got on location, he was just so so wonderful. Jekyll, Richard Jekyll. Richard I Jekyll. knew I'd get it, yeah, Jake. Sure. As a matter of fact, Gene Hackman came in to read for that part too, and that's the one I wanted. You know, yeah. I think. That, but Jekyll just turned out well. As a matter of fact, he got a nomination in that part. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Who directed that? Uh, it was directed by Paul Newman. Yeah. The first director was. Uh, dismissed, shall we say. <laughs> yeah. Dismissed after the first three weeks. Yeah. And so Newman took it over. Taking somebody else's work and trying to do justice to it is, under any circumstances, <laughs> a difficult proposition. And each one has to be done, uh, uh, each one has to be done just for that, for that particular work. In other words, you can't use the same rule for this book as you use for that book. So yeah. I, I take any book, any novel, and I break it down. The very first thing I do is break it down into scenes, into these scenes that I think I'm going to be using, into the scenes that have dramatic quality. And when I get that breakdown, which may be 10, sometimes 30 pages, I don't know, whatever, no matter how long the novel is, then I try to see where the story peaks, where it's going to go. Uh, what what character should be brought out more, which character should <laughs> disappear more. And all of that has to be done in advance of any right, of any just sitting down to write, at least for me. Of course, everybody has a, you know, a, different, a different way of doing it, but uh, any story. And, and, uh, then, and then you have to make these decisions. And then the decisions you have to make, you don't want to violate the book. Yeah. I, everything I've ever done, every novel I've done, and I've done quite a few, I've always tried to stay true to the book. Even though I had to go <laughs> askance here and there, uh, a classic example I think is uh, Hunchback and Redon. Yeah. In that, Esmeralda, the beautiful girl, in the book, in Hugo's book, my God, she chooses the affection of a goat over a heart-leading <laughs> man, over the hero. You can't do anything like that, my God. But there was a story that you said to yourself immediately: "It's Beauty and the Beast. It's just." Basically, what it is, it's a love story, you know, between this yeah. monster, you know, who is more misshapen than Richard III and, and this gorgeous girl. And, and then in addition, you have a wonderful situation in that particular case, when you break it all down, that the archbishop, who has a lust for this girl, but in addition to that, 
in the book, wasn't in the first picture, but he also has a, uh, he, he also really, lo he, he would never admit it, but he has an emotional attachment to her that he won't admit to himself, and we played that for all of its worth, too. Those things, you, you look for values in the characters in yeah. addition to the structure and the plot as it goes along. Now, the structure in a, in, in a screenplay doesn't necessarily follow the structure <laughs> in the book, does it? It can't sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, if you're doing Dickens, yes. Yeah. Dickens, Dickens just wrote that way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I swear anybody could come in and take, as I did do, a, for instance, a, a Tale of Two Cities. Tale of Two Cities, it's... Yeah. It's hard to miss. It's hard to miss. There have been five of them, I think, films of Tale of Two Cities. I did one. Uh, and uh, it, it's just all, it's so delicious. And it's all there. And when you think, talk about writing, when you think that Dickens sat down and didn't write that as a book, sat down and write that as a monthly, for a monthly periodical, and I'm saying to myself, did he know what was going to come on next month? Did he yeah. take that kind of a chance? You know, it was published. Uh, what are the battle of those? Dickens... Wild, yeah. those, er, those, those English writers were something else. Do you feel more freedom in facing the blank page and writing an original? Uh, or do you feel more freedom knowing that you've <coughs> got characters and that you can work with them? I think if you have, it, do I think an original has, you have more freedom writing an original or do I have more freedom yeah. writing <coughs> an adaptation? Uh, if you have your original in mind and you know what you want and you've, those characters are there, then I think you do have more freedom because you, when you're adapting, you always have, I always have in the back of my mind, am I doing justice to the characters that this other writer wrote? Mm -hmm. Am I, and I don't let myself go all the way. I stay within the boundaries of, of, of that author. Uh, it, you can, that can change uh, according to the author. If you're doing Hemingway, Heming's, Hemingway's dialogue, there have been Hemingway's successful film, dialogue's very stilted. It looks wonderful on the page, absolutely wonderful. But it's so simple that it becomes affected. It's, it's a strange <laughs> phenomenon, you know. But I'm, I never adapted Hemingway's, but I, but I, I, would, I would think, uh, uh, to hear him is, uh, yeah. is not normal speech, dialogue. Yeah. And then you have to make that decision when you adapt that a famous work with dialogue needs to be changed to be played. Well, you do, if you're doing, for, for instance, if you're doing Ivanhoe, and the language is so, <laughs> it's all in that, you, that kind of language today, uh, uh, you wouldn't, uh, it, it just wouldn't have any commercial possibilities at all. So you have to do a kind of a, a thing in your head. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know how to explain that, but you have to take this old archaic, English and and put it not in contemporary terms for God's sake you can't do that but you have to make it in a in a in a way that's understandable and dramatic and believable and and I don't know how you do that it's just uh, something that when you when you were doing uh, these films uh, various screenplays and you wrote many um, most of them were adaptations weren't they when I came out here yeah. yes all my er first work in New York yeah. And God knows how many originals I wrote. They were all, they were originals. Yeah. When I came out here, since that time, outside of uh, Playhouse Ninety or two, yeah, they they've all been adaptations. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When you you did a, a a very unusual thing in terms of a career, in that you went from live television to full length feature films, mm -hmm. and then you went into television, but in the long form area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The two to four to six hour right. films, yes, and that became a, just a, an enormous amount of work. You have you have whatever <laughs> yeah. twenty five or thirty. Yeah, there's a lot of them. There's a lot yeah, of, them. yeah. Of, of those films, you've mentioned a couple of them already, but most of those were adaptations, weren't they? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes, adaptations. Yeah. Yes, uh, there were a couple in there. I think yeah. the Howard Hughes one I did was an original, and uh, I don't know there's a couple, but most of them, most of them were adaptations. I got into motion picture for television because I was I'm not getting feature film work right. anymore. Right. So I went into feature. So I went into television work, two hour films, four hour films, whatever, three hour films, yeah. and uh, and. Uh, unlike features, you didn't spend months and months and then go back and forth and so forth. 
Yeah. In those days, nowadays, they're getting back to spending more and more time, it seems, yeah. <laughs> and selling the television. But back then, you could, you could write a television script in the two hours in, in, in a given time, and they could read it in a given time. It could be produced within a given time. Yeah. It was wonderful, you know. Uh, but no, as far as the two hours or four hours are concerned, I, I did one, uh, oh, about five years ago called, uh, um, called I called it Double Take. Mm -hmm. It was Richard Crenna, but uh, the, the adaptation of A Cop in New York. Mm -hmm. And I was given the book and by a, a New York producer, Herb Brockton, that I'd worked with in the live days. And I read the book, and I said, I called him back. I was in Maine at the time. I called him back, and I said, yo, great. And I'll get to work on it. <clears throat> and then he called me back three days later, and he said, John, I think, the, I'm not sure you understand this. It's not a two-hour. It's a four-hour. It's a miniseries. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. But then the book was such that I could put it into a four hour without any stretch at all. I could yeah. put it into a four hour. So when you adapt and you're giving those, <laughs> you're giving those parameters, yeah. two hour, four hour, or three hour, that's what you better do. Uh, sometimes you tell the network, this is really five hours, you yeah. know? And then, uh, because you're just going to hurt the book if you can't have at least five hours. The network will tell you then, and your producer, Go ahead, write the five hours. We'll probably do it then if it's that good. <laughs> then they always cut out. They, yeah. they just want you to write as much as possible. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, the, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, <clears throat> uh, long form that you've done has been of the, the crime story variety. Yeah, quite, yeah, uh, docudramas. Docudramas. Yeah. yeah, that's what we call it, docudramas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I got started on that. I think the first one I did was the, uh, Carol Chessman, the Red Light Bandit. Yes, yes. Uh, in there, it was a famous case in California, rather. California time. Uh, he had written four books saying he was innocent. And so I adapted it from those books, okay. the four books. But then I just, I just didn't really have a feeling of the man. So I found out in reading the books that he had one lawyer, a woman lawyer, Rosalie Asher, lived in Sacramento. So I went up to Sacramento and stayed there a week. And her house was like a museum. Of newspaper clippings from, <laughs> and uh, and she had uh, an emotional attachment to this man. After uh, I would not say a romantic one, but yeah. but when he got the chair, <laughs> she <laughs> she uh, yeah. Yeah. And, so, and she was a w wonderful fund of information. As a matter of fact, as a writer, I don't know if this will inter this story as a writer it should, yeah. because she told me that when the day came, he had about four reprieves, mm -hmm. and this. Came and now the California Supreme Court. She went to the California Supreme Court to get a reprieve, which she thought would be the final one, because the the uh, political nature of the course had changed. And incidentally, he, he was up for a, um, a, it was a capital rape was a capital offense then, mm -hmm. and he had all the women in the world, and we don't think he raped that, this particular woman, but it was a capital offense. You could get the chair for it. So she went to the California Supreme Court justice and. He said, all right, he has the reprieve. This is like a Warner Brothers film, an old gangster. Call up the, call up the warden. So the secretary calls up the warden, gets the wrong number. Oh. And she calls up again, and somebody there, and somebody there, and it got held up. And he went, he got the chair. So I said to, I said to Rosalie, the lawyer, are you certain of this? <laughs> because, I mean, this, this is a little bit difficult, excuse me, to believe. But she, oh, absolutely. And then she showed me newspaper clippings from the Herald Examiner up there in, mm -hmm. in, uh, up there in um, San Francisco. <clears throat> and so I said, God, whoa, what drama. You know, Alan Alden played a part, Alan Alden. And sure enough, he got there and the thing, the phone call was all in the show. And it was wonderful. It was very dramatic. About three weeks later, there's an article in, uh, in TV Guide uh, saying that the docudramas are all a bunch of crap. <laughs> we don't pay attention to the facts and leading and using my, <laughs> my, as, my as the lead example, you know, of saying that this incident never happened. Well, boy, did I, <laughs> I wrote a letter, I wrote a short letter, TV guy hoping they publish it, which they didn't. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, I wrote a longer letter and the guy who wrote the article just slept it off. Well, so I'm busy now. I can't, he, he had no leg to stand on. But then, Writer's Revenge, there was a seminar in Ojai on docudramas. About a year later, about five writers, docudramas, directors, producers, journalists across the country all came to us, and he was one of them. Ah. So there, in front of, we're talking about a writer's revenge, there in front of everybody, we're, in the, it was the responsibility of the dramatist to write docudramas. And I said, let's talk about the responsibility of journalists. 
to report Dr. Jamas, and I just laid him low, you know, and had all the proof there. I asked him afterwards, I said, why would you call me a liar in print, you know, when you, yeah. he said, well, I was in San Francisco at the time, I didn't remember that. <laughs> But yeah, Dr. Dramas, I've done several with uh, Joe McGinnis, who right now, I had dinner with him last night, he's covering, he's there every day at the trial, you know, he has a permanent seat at the trial. Right. Dominic Dunn and Joe McGinnis were the only two, I think, that have permanent seats. Yeah. And uh, I did uh, yeah, Fatal, Vision Fatal Vision with him, and I did Blind Faith and Cooled Up. Yeah. All three docudramas, all three murder cases. And in each case, in doing a docudrama, although I have the book and Joe is a marvelous journalist, a wonderful yeah. writer, in spite of that, I want to talk to people. And so I go back and find out where they live, and I go see them. And so Joe can write, this and so and such happened, but when I talk to them, I say, well, who was in the room, and where were they sitting at the time? And when you came in, what was the first thing he said? Things that, that Joe is not interested in, as I am, in dramatizing the situation. Sure, sure. Uh, I do that in, in all of those So situations. you really do independent research. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, in those, in, in the, all, all of his books, although they're all adapted from his books. But I want to find out from the people who are involved. I, I've been, because of that, I've been in prisons. <laughs> I've talked to murderers. <laughs> I, the last show was a, a, a young man that's in up for life for murdering his uh, stepfather. And uh, I came out, and here was this kid was about, I don't know, 21, 22, and he's a murderer. He didn't do it himself, but he hired somebody. And I, and I came away feeling, look at that poor kid. <laughs> he was so, he just seemed so helpless. How did they ever get caught in this situation, you know? But I played it, st you know, straight in the film, boy. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that's, I, 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 uh, yeah. I identified with those people too, especially in Fatal Vision, the father that Carl Malden played. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I forced Carl Malden on. Nobody wanted Carl Malden. Up for the father, and he was, and he was wonderful. But uh, in doing, in doing, Fatal Vision, I went back and talked to the original, to the uh, the father and the mother of the, uh, actually he was the stepfather of the woman, <coughs> the woman who was killed, the daughter who was killed, and her children, yeah. and Freddie uh, Kassab and Millie Kassab, and they lived out in Long Island, and I just, just went through everything with them, and it's it was it was a bigger insight even than you know than I could get from Joe's book. And, and as a matter of fact, I'll never forget, Freddie Freddie died about last, about six months ago, and Freddie said to me that if McDonald, in that case his name was Jeff McDonald, he was the Green Beret doctor who was accused and convicted of murdering his family, he said if McDonald ever gets out of prison while well, I'm alive, he won't be alive much longer <laughs> because he's so afraid he's going to be released because he has all these, any, th any case like that that involves money, as <laughs> we know, the Simpson case, Lawyers, people come from you know, from everywhere. Sure. You know, when it involves money, McDonald sued Joe uh, McGinnis, saying that he double-crossed him because Joe had promised him that he would come out innocent in the book. Uh, I mean, it was just it was ridiculous. Yeah. But there it was, you know. And Joe had to go to court and all of that stuff. But Dr. Dramas, there's a, there's a, there's a tremendous responsibility there, especially when you come to the networks. The networks said, "Well, when couldn't we do so forth?" I said, "No." That person is alive. That person is sitting home watching this show. You may get sued. I may get sued. Yeah. You know, you can't do that. And besides, it isn't the truth. These things are only good as long as they have, as long as they're valid. If they have validity, a docudrama is, is wonderful. If it has no validity, I don't care. I don't want it. I don't want to see it. it uh, and I think they have, too many of them now have gone too far afield for dramatic purposes. In fact, now they will say, this is based upon loosely or whatever, the story, you know. And, uh, the phrase, based upon a true story, is yeah. now somewhat yeah. cynical. It's, it's different. Yeah, it's a quite different, no, different situation than really sticking with the facts. And I'll tell you something else. The facts are more interesting. The yeah. facts, as you get it from these people, from their mouths and from the book, are far more interesting. There's a scene in Fatal Vision that's an interrogation scene by two or three cops of McDonald's sitting there. And for me, for a writer, I, all I did was to edit it. It was, it was there. I couldn't know. There's no way I could make that interrogation scene any better. It was off the wall here and there. Strange twists from his strange mind, you know? And uh, I just, I just, uh, I wanted to use the thing in its entirety, you know, but we, but we edited it down. And I could you know, come in and, and, and then make up some kind of interrogation scene. Ah, yeah. truth is always more <laughs> interesting. But still, even in doctor drama, 
hmm. structure is oh, the yes, problem. Oh yes, that's isn't where it? you have to. Yeah. That's where you have to take a time, <clears throat> time sequences and put them perhaps out of order, yeah. in order to have a dramatic structure that builds and has a beginning, middle, and the end. Otherwise, you're going to go back and forth. I'll tell you. <laughs> It isn't docudrama, but this is a true story. I worked over at Fox once on a film for Irwin Allen. Yeah. I never, I don't know if you've ever worked I, I for do. Irwin Allen. I do. This is absolutely true. And he had three, sto two story editors. And I wrote the script and I brought it back to him. They said, this is, oh, this is fine, John, but we have a problem here. And they said, I said what? What is it? You'd like it? So, no, he said, no, that's good. This is good. But you see, we have a formula here and it's worked for Irwin very well. And I said, well, <laughs> what's the, for, you know, well, he says, we like to do comedy and drama and action. Comedy, drama, action. Comedy, drama, action. And what you have here is comedy, comedy, then action, 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 <laughs> then drama, drama. <laughs> and I'm listening to these two guys, and I, I didn't know they were putting me on. Absolutely not. No. We've got to change this so it, it follows this formula for Irwin. Comedy, <laughs> drama, action. <laughs> Well, I walked off then. They did it. My name was still on it. <laughs> it was terrible. Well, that's the desperate search for an equation. <laughs> yes. a, a, a way of doing this, yeah. a way of there writing. There you are. Yeah. Comedy, drama, action. Yeah. Oh, God. A formula. <clears throat> yeah, but no, it, it's true in docudramas. You do, <clears throat> you do have to take a ch time sequence out. Yeah. And, but, God, yeah, I, I stay extremely true to those characters. I, I, and the ones that I've done, and I have not had, I haven't had anybody <laughs> complain to me yet or write me letters saying I wouldn't have said that or I didn't do that sure. or whatever. Because, uh, yes, of course you do. <clears throat> you cannot play a complete scene unless you do that. But if you have the key things that happen in that scene from the people involved, including some of their dialogue, and you put that in the context of a scene, it's, it's going to work, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, but, but uh, of course, uh, uh, Joe, uh, when McGinnis, I uh, adapt McGinnis's books, he has, it's, it's a different form. Yeah. He would take all the cops first and then go to the family, you know, yeah. where I can't do that. I have to go cops, family, and, 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 uh, and build it through, through all facets instead of just hitting on one thing. It's a whole different form. It's a whole different form. And even though it's a docudrama and these things actually happen, the screenplay is going to be different from the book, and Joe knows that, and we get along beautifully. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to write out of the Simpson trial. <laughs> Even though uh, the concept of docudrama uh, is goes way back, Louis de Rochemont and those films oh, yes, years ago, yeah. it goes way back. <clears throat> Henry Hathaway was one of the first. Nobody gives Henry Burrow Henry credit for that, you know. Yeah. But, but it does go way back. But I think what television, what you have done, and what the medium of television has done is to kind of recreate docudrama in view of the immediacy of these cases, these crime stories, yes. the Jeffrey McDonald story. And That's right. It's, it's kind of, you really recreated. I think that was maybe what that gathering was about, wasn't it, a few years ago when you all got together? That's right. It's true. It was the responsibility of writing these shows. No, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> and in, in this particular show, Fatal Vision, for instance, because there was never a definitive motivation. That was the big thing that was missing. A definitive motivation for his having done, although everything else was there in spades, the definitive motivation. So when I finished the script and I did the rewrites, I remember I was over at NBC <clears throat> and the fellow was in charge then, I forget who it was, they move around a lot, okay. said to me, John, we've got, we've got this, we love the script, but we don't, but where's the motivation? Why did this fellow do it? And I said to him, you know, I have a feeling that when people see this show, they're going to be talking about it a lot because there's no definitive motivation. If we had one, oh, it's another cop show. You know? And I think that's why people still have doubts in their mind about McDonald, although I don't have any. You know? uh, <clears throat> Patty Chayefsky used to call that network need the rubber ducky scene, <laughs> where the, the character would say, when I was a kid, somebody stole my rubber, rubber ducky, ducky, and that's yeah. why I became a serial murderer. <laughs> but Noel Coward had a line, I think it was from Private Lies, saying, I refuse, when, the, when the, the leading man said, I refuse to go through years and years of expensive uh, psychiatry only to discover at the age of three I was in love with my rocking horse, <laughs> which is the same thing right. as the rough right. and ducky ducky. Right.